Hello and welcome to this new episode. Uh, we're gonna dive into the age of Gemini. So in the last episode we were uh, going into the age of Cancer and uh, very much, well, the great mother and the symbolism that like relates to that. And uh, this coming together of these different opposites and this theme uh, very much continues uh, in the age of Gemini. And um, I really do want to like start off uh, going back to the age of Cancer as this base for the age of Gemini. And a lot of these um, rituals and, well, in, in that sense, um, how, how could you... Uh, how, how could I put that? I guess like, yeah, the, the hunter-gatherer base of it all before diving uh, deeper into that because we touched upon the um, hunter-gatherer base already a bit uh, in the previous episode. And um, now we can go a little bit deeper uh, into that, specifically regarding the hunter-gatherer and like the the later Corios and Arcthea links that are uh, present. And, um, yeah, very much like the, the deeper even link regarding, like, uh, I would say, like, Age of Cancer, even Age of Leo, uh, cave rituals that are, I mean, they're even older than that. So, yeah, um, I would say uh, first to dive into the Age of uh, Cancer and then uh, go deeper into that and then uh, emerge into the Age of Gemini. So, in the last episode, we were talking about Gobekli Tepe and, well, this, like, um, totemism and clan kinship uh, across these hunter-gatherer uh, bands, you know, and then there's this, like, funer funeral ancestor cult aspect of it all. But then I also talked a bit about the, um, well, the hunter-gatherer, kind of like Corios, Arctea kind of side as well, uh, with regarding to that. And, you know, you can see that with, like, some of the, the sculptures and, and, and very, like, these um, engravings in, into the stone that, uh, that have been found as well um, already regarding this animal symbolism. And very much regarding this animal symbolism, like, you know, then I would really like to go into uh, totems and animal symbolism first. And then, you know, very much go into, like, also the ancestor worship that is there. And very much from, like, the hunter-gatherer perspective this time. So, maybe, first of all, I could very much specify, like, what is a totem. And uh, a totem is a spirit being, a sacred object or symbol that serves as an emblem of a group of people, such as a family, clan, lineage, or tribe. And uh, we're here talking specifically about an animal totem and uh, an animal totem is a spiritual symbol or guide in many hunter-gatherer tribes and it is an animal that is believed to have a special connection with a person family or tribe and is seen as a source of guidance protection and wisdom and the animal totem is believed to possess certain qualities or characteristics that are desirable and can, you know, help a person to overcome challenges or achieve their goals. Um, little side note, like for, for me, for instance, that would be the um, a, the particular wolf spirit that um, is connected to that, like as an animal totem, and that and the fox, uh, for me personally, and. Um, when working with kind of these energies, one can really um, notice that if you really tap into that through this animal symbolism and, and create this relationship um, with it. You know, and in, in, in the context of like hunter-gatherer tribes, really like, well, the, the animal totem is considered to be a representation of the individual's inner spirit or soul. And it is believed that each person has an animal totem that is uniquely suited to their personality, strengths, and weaknesses. And, um, yeah, very much like the animal totem is thought to, like, you know, also reveal insights about a person's purpose in life and can provide guidance and support throughout their journey. Then, very much like how it 
how one like really discovers these animal totems as well. It's it's often uh, through dreams or visions or like other mystical experiences, and they can also be passed down through family or tribal traditions with certain animals being associated with specific lineages or clans. You know, and this you can also see um, regarding Gobekli Tepe as well. With like these different enclosures having these different animal totems connected to these different clans, and um, in in that sense, you could also say like you know like the these different tribes and fa- and families. Looking at the the general uh, context, but also uh, go back to Tepe as well. You know when. Really, when a person discovers their animal totem, they may perform rituals or ceremonies to honor the animal and establish a deeper connection with it. You know, and you can see that too with like the Quebec type of rituals, but also with the Corios and Arctea rituals as well. And in many hunter-gatherer cultures, the animal totem is also seen as a way to connect with the natural world and the cycles of the earth. And... Um, by recognizing and honoring the wisdom of the animal kingdom, individuals can gain a greater understanding of their place in the world and their relationship with the natural environment, which you will be able to like later see uh, with like the Corios and Arctea rituals as well uh, that I will go deeper into. From a union perspective, um, if we look through that lens, uh, these totem animals can be seen as archetypal figures that embody a specific quality um, or characteristic that are desirable or needed. For example, um, if we take a wolf totem, it may represent qualities such as loyalty, courage, and intuition, um, while an owl totem may represent wisdom, insight, and the ability to see through illusions. Um, in addition, totem animals can be seen as a way of connecting with the natural world and the instinctual aspects of the psyche. And by identifying with a particular totem animal, um, well, really, individuals can, you know, th- then tap into the uh, these primal instincts, you know, these, uh, well, really their own primal instincts and connect with the natural world in a deeper and more meaningful way. You know, and like I said, these are also present in Gobekli Tepe, and uh, it's partly next to the Great Mother Cult, um, which you know, which aspects I focused more uh, on in the previous episode. One of the further reasons for you know this coming together of these hunter-gatherer bands, but then you also have the funerary and ancestor cult as well. Um, re- regarding that, like in Gobekli Tepe, they placed skulls on small T-shaped pillars in the temple to honor the dead. Uh, similarly, in um, Katalhuyuk as well, they did um, pretty similar rituals. Looking at the significance within the Gobekli Tepe culture, uh, from the, the research that has been done on it, um, what can be really clear is that this T-shaped form very much describes the underworld uh, of their cosmological belief system, where the um, paired T-shapes indicate a concept of twins. And in Gobekli Tepe, they set aside two T-shaped pillars in the center of a circle of other T-shaped pillars. Um, Both of these pillars had the same sign inscribed or carved on them, and this made them identical or the same, and due to and due to their large size, the great ones um, could be seen as the twins. The Egyptians also inscribed the T shapes on the panel writ large, um, indicating the great ones, the twins. Another T shaped pillar from Gobekli Tepe is also translated to show the T's relationship to the cosmology. You know, it, it is composed of the form of a vertical place that was within it a net of serpents, um, representing the crisscrossing currents of the underworld. And um, the smaller T-shaped pillars where the skulls were placed also signified ancestors and the underworld. Regarding these crisscrossing currents of the underworld, we can, from a union lens, very much um, think the, the different uh, streams of libido and this um, 
I guess, this conflicting of these different streams. But now coming to the hunter-gatherer societies and, and, you know, the ancestor worship that they did. Well, regarding to ancestor worship, it, it is often based on the belief that the ancestors continue to exist in a spiritual realm and can influence the lives of the living. Um, ancestors are seen as important sources of knowledge, wisdom, and protection, and they are believed to have a special connection with their living descendants. In some societies, um, ancestors are also believed to have the power to intervene in the affairs of the living, either for good or for ill. Hunter-gatherer ancestor worship can take many different forms, uh, depending on the specific cultural context. It may involve offerings of food, drink, or other items to the ancestors, as well as the performance of rituals or ceremonies designed to honor and communicate with them. Um, ancestors may also be invoked in times of crises or needs, such as during illness or times of war. And in shamanic ancestor worship, the focus is often on communicating with the spirits of the ancestors for the purpose of gaining guidance, wisdom, or healing. And um, shamanic practitioners may use various methods to connect with ancestral spirits including meditation, trance states, and the use of psychoactive plants or substances, depending on the tradition. And shamanic practitioners may also create altars or other sacred spaces dedicated to the ancestors. And they may perform rituals or ceremonies to honor and communicate with them. And... Um, very much in both hunter-gatherer ancestor worship and shamanic ancestor worship, the focus is on um, maintaining a connection with the spiritual realm and the wisdom and guidance of the ancestors. These practices can help individuals to gain a greater understanding of their place in the world and their relationship with their ancestors and the natural environment. And in Jungian psychology, well, it very much can 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 see in, in in the following light, you know, that these ancestors can really be seen as symbolic representations of the collective unconscious, you know, and, and the collective unconscious is the universal storehouse of images, symbols, and archetypes that are shared by all human beings. These archetypes can manifest in various forms, including mythological figures, um, religious symbols and cultural practices such as ancestor worship. And in that sense, ancestor worship can be seen as a way of connecting with and tapping into the collective unconscious. And by honoring and communicating with the spirits of deceased ancestors, individuals can access the wisdom and guidance that is embedded in the collective unconscious. Even though uh, I would want to add uh, one thing that Nick from uh, Three World Shamanism often would say regarding the ancestors and, and, and the spirits, just because they're dead doesn't mean they're wise. So one has to be really um, aware of that fact, that indeed there is also ill that can come from it. And you have to be very, um, yeah, very um, discerning regarding these things. You know, in, in, in addition, ancestor worship can, you know, also be seen as a way of maintaining a connection with the past and with one's cultural roots. And this can be important for individuals seeking to establish a sense of identity and meaning in their lives. Um, and these ancestral figures can serve as guides or role models, providing a sense of continu continuity and tradition that can be grounding and stabilizing. And from a union perspective, um, ancestor worship can also be seen as a way of integrating the shadow or the repressed or unconscious aspects of the psyche. You know, by connecting with the spirits of deceased ancestors, individuals may be able to confront and integrate aspects of their own shadow selves that they may have been unaware of or unwilling to acknowledge. And this can be an important step in the individuation process or the process of becoming a fully realized and integrated individual. Similarly, like, you know, these kind of rituals associated with the ancestors, but also like these um, animal totems 
and and these ancient uh, rituals tap into the collective unconscious and these ancient patterns of behavior and um, these ancient rituals in of itself as well, which is why tapping into these rituals can be so powerful and and very uh, much lead to very big shifts, even though these shifts often come with, uh, well, a lot of um, turmoil uh, internally because it is very much like a shifting around of uh, of kind of like these different pieces inside and, and this shifting around kind of creates um, this space for these different emotions and these different um, aspects of the shadow to emerge and to actually... Um, have a chance to be integrated and acknowledged. When it comes to the ancestor worship, there is obviously, uh, you know, like I said, a link to the underworld. And you can also see with the snake goddess, uh, this link where there's like with the mother goddess, this fertility aspect that we talked about. And... um, Similarly, with the vegetation deity, there's this like dying and rising aspect to that as well. It's a combination of both uh, kind of sides. But then, you know, um, in this episode, we're going to go deeper into like the Arctea and the Koryos um, kind of rituals uh, that are kind of leading into this divine couple ceremony that we talked about in the Age of uh, Cancer episode where it's very much this uh, coming together of these opposites. But first, um, one has to face these different things, um, you know, regarding the shadow before um, one can integrate the anima or the animus, uh, respectively. And um, these these rituals regarding the Arctea and Koryos very much were about um, yeah, integrating the shadow and become um, more more integrated individuals. So that then one can work on this divine couple ceremony and uh, very much uh, be able to to do so and and to really uh, be able to do this dance you know and this this coming together also uh, um, is symbolized in the divine couple uh, how I talked about in the age of cancer episode as well and um, Arctea and Koryos are as much linked to the Great Mother as much to the Sky Father. Because both, like, you know, for instance, Artemis and Apollo are linked both to, like, the Great Mother and the Sky Father. But I also would really like to bring up this quote by uh, Fortress of Luke also that I feel is very much relevant uh, to this as well. And he said there that uh, the idea that a woman could hold Political power is linked to another Indo-European concept that the sovereignty of a kingdom ultimately rests with the woman. Um, in the most ancient times, the king was seen as a representative of or, um, or embodiment of the god of heaven, and his wife was the embodiment of the goddess of the earth. And it was she who held the power of sovereignty, which could only be um, obtained by the king through his marriage to her. But this uh, was not and could not be the oppression of the woman, just as the land, if held through violence and fear, would ruin, um, you know, it would be ruined through constant strife. So the wife also must be a willing partner. And, um, you know, in in, in that sense, he said that power um, could only be properly manifested by a harmonious balance between masculine and feminine, sky and earth. And without this, the land and people would come to ruin. You know, each had their own roles, but, uh, you know, the ideal was a balanced union, uh, representative of the natural order, uh, you know, not of violent subjugation. And this very much links to um, this sacred marriage ceremony as well, and this coming together that that I talked about in the Age of uh, Cancer episode. We're also um, regarding to the the Thracian mysteries. There's the same idea of this coming together through the king and the queen, um, heaven and earth, symbolized uh, in this similar way. But like I said, there's first a need to to integrate um, 
the the dual aspects of both the feminine and the masculine within before one can very much even attempt to 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 do this uh, um this kind of like coming together of these opposites and this very much was done through uh, for instance these arctea and choreos rituals that I'm going to talk about and those rituals very much uh, link back to the older hunter-gatherer cave rituals, and that's why we have to like very much go into these first, these cave rituals, to really provide the context for the the later rituals as well. So you can see like why there's this you know animal symbolism in there, and um, similarly why we talked about the, you know like that regarding the animal totem as well. Because that's very much relevant uh, for the, the symbolism and also this connection to the collective unconscious and these archetypal patterns. What's very much clear is that these cave rituals are the source for both the Arctea and Chorios um, from you know Proto-Indo-European mythology and also the most likely source for the hunter-shamanism of Gobekli Tepe from Anatolian culture. Well, now when it comes to these cave rituals... Um, the caves, as we are well aware, contain artwork that often portrays uh, local wildlife confronting the local hunters, which um, has been interpreted as a type of hunting magic. Some cave paintings also seem to depict adolescent initiation rites and dance rituals, early shamanism and flute playing. Um, hunter gather cave ritual dances were you know, also an important aspect of shamanic practices in many cultures. And these dances were often performed in sacred caves or other natural settings and were used to connect with the spirits and energies of the natural world. The dances were often accompanied by rhythmic drumming or other forms of music and were performed in a group setting. And the uh, rhythmic drumming was a uh, common accompaniment uh, to the dances, with drums made from materials such as animal skins, wood, or gourds, and um, other percussion instruments such as rattles or clapping sticks may also have been used. And um, the evidence from, from this uh, has been found uh, from, um, well, archaeological but also anthropological um, sources and like dig sites that uh, that have found um, evidence of these through well in some sense both depictions um, within art but also um, some remains of, of um, bones and um, different materials that would um, hint at these instruments being used. And in some cultures, wind instruments such as flutes or horns were also used, along with stringed instruments like the lute or harp. Especially those were uh, generally later in the cave rituals. And these instruments were often made from natural materials such as wood or animal bones, like I said. And often those were um, found. The shaman would, you know, often lead the dance and the dancers would follow in a trance-like state moving their bodies in a ritualized manner. The cave rituals and shamanic practices of hunter-gatherer cultures are you know, believed to date back tens of thousands of years with evidence of ritual activity found in cave paintings and other archaeological sites from as far back as the upper Paleolithic era, so that's four, uh, 40,000 to 10,000 BCE, and this period spans the last cycles of the Ice Age. The um, currently accepted interpretation of, um, of, of this art uh, contends that the majority of the cave images are manifestations of shamanic ritual mediated through visionary experience in altered states of consciousness. And uh, dances were often focused on specific intentions, such as seeking the cooperation of the, um, of the spirits in a hunt or connecting with the energies of the land for fertility and abundance. The movements and gestures of the dance were believed to have symbolic meanings and were often related to the 
qualities and powers of the animals or other spirits being um, spirits being invoked. In many cultures, the dances were also accompanied by the use of psychoactive plants, which were believed to enhance the shamanic trance and allow for deeper connection with the spirits. And these plants were often used in ceremonial contexts and were seen as sacred tools for accessing the spiritual realm. Then, in the context of hunting magic specifically, the shamanic trance was often used to connect with the animals and to seek their cooperation in the hunt. The um, shaman would enter into a trance state and communicate with the spirits of the animals, um, asking for their help in providing food for the tribe. And this was often done through the use of animal totems, which were seen as representing the qualities and powers um, of these animals, and which could um, be invoked through shamanic practices. Then also, the fertility rites were also an important part of hunter-gatherer cave rituals, as these were closely connected to the cycles of nature and the animals. These rites were often focused on the worship of the goddess or feminine principle and involved offerings and sacrifices to ensure the fertility of the land and the animals. The shaman would you know, enter into a trance state and connect with the spirits of the land and the animals, asking for their help in ensuring fertility and abundance. And a lot of these rituals you can also see in the Age of Cancer video that um, we went into the Great Mother symbolism as well.